Hi, I'm Dr. Shiva Guide. I'm a clinical psychologist specialized in PTSD, anxiety, and mood disorders. Um, I'm here with Taylor Winston. Uh, he's been my right-hand man in helping me spread the word, and we're putting together a set of videos that are complementary to the documents that I've been writing all year since uh, the massacre in Las Vegas on October 1st in 2017. Um, so we hope that you'll watch all of them. Uh, and preferably in chronological order, but if you just happen to be getting on for this video, hopefully you'll have a good understanding about uh, some general facts about uh, PTSD. Hi, Taylor. Hi, Doctor. So, do you have any questions for me? I do. Um, so, I've been coming to a lot of group meetings and I've learned a lot of this education already, um, but something that you know I think is highly important is knowing how PTSD develops and I don't know if it's something that I'll be able to avoid maybe later on down the line but at least I can get some fundamentals on what I'm experiencing and going through and it may help a lot of others um, going through what I'm experiencing and yourself absolutely yeah so um so the purpose of this video is for us to talk about what trauma is. Um, and trauma is not the same thing as PTSD. PTSD is a diagnosis. Uh, it's one of a few different trauma-related diagnoses, but uh, we can talk about trauma in a more general sense. So uh, trauma, what is trauma? What did you think trauma was before you came into all of these group sessions and got um, a lot of psychoeducation? Before, maybe just something that, you know, heavily impacted in one's life, you know, a loss um, or some injury or something and just moving forward from there is near impossible and it's not fun and sucks and it's not a fun word. Yeah, okay, so that's excellent. That's how actually most people that I speak with when they first come in for treatment, what they think about trauma. Um, there's actually not a lot of understanding about trauma or PTSD or any of that, um, much less mental illness in general. So um, we're gonna destigmatize all of this uh, but let's start with a definition of trauma. What is trauma? Trauma is a psychological injury in which we see biological changes. That means changes in our physiology, our anatomy. We also see cognitive changes. That means our thought processing changes. And the third part of this is that we see emotional impact. And that means it changes the way we feel. So some of that you captured really well in your understanding of trauma. It does impact our lives. And it impacts our life in every possible way you can think of, the same way that depression and anxiety and other kinds of psychiatric illnesses do. Um, one thing that we have to remember is the brain is an organ, like every other organ system. And so it's very unfortunate that mental illness is so stigmatized because people don't really think much if you say, oh, I've got diabetes or I have sensitive skin or I have uh, you know, high blood pressure. But the minute you say to somebody that you have PTSD or you have depression or you have anxiety or you have panic attacks, all of a sudden people get really nervous. They, they, don't, they have anxiety about it and they don't understand it. So, so now that we know what trauma is, what other questions do you have about that? Um, you wanna know a little bit more about the science? I'd love to know about science. Okay. Uh, you taught us in group. You know, it's uh, separated and it is an organ like anything else yeah. and should be treated as such as maybe a physical injury, um, but that attacks the mental um, well being of ourselves. Absolutely. So we'll talk about the science for a few minutes. And there are some very, very uh, specific reasons that I teach the science. I think it's really important to help people understand that it is an organ like every other organ system and therefore this is a medical issue. When you have symptoms of depression, anxiety, those are the most um, common things that we see. Uh, or if you have symptoms of trauma, which kind of include both of those. Um, also, I find that teaching these things just destigmatize mental illness and when people understand the science they are more likely to ask for help and more likely to talk about it and be open and that's really important so let's start from the beginning so we were both at the route 91 concert and so we were both there taylor when bullets started coming our way so when bullets are coming towards you that is obviously a life-threatening situation you could replace this with any other kind of trauma, but in that moment, our lion was, what was our lion? Um, 
the bullets. That's right, bullets. Bullets coming straight towards us. It wasn't necessarily guns because guns sitting and doing nothing aren't really going to hurt us. But the bullets coming into our direction, that was our saber-toothed tiger. So at that time, a structure, and I'll try to write neatly, but a structure called the thalamus is taking in information through your eyes, your ears, sounds, sights, smells, everything that's going on in the environment. The thalamus is one of the, the a handful of structures that lives in the midbrain, in the limbic system. If you've seen that wonderful Pixar film, Inside Out, which is a really brilliant movie about how important, yes, how important all of our emotions are, um, and they have described the five primary emotions, then you know that they live in this headquarters. Well, the, the emotions in that headquarters is what we call the amygdala. And the headquarters we can think of as the, the keyboard, the command center, that's your hypothalamus, but we'll get there in a minute. So the thalamus is taking in all this information and it's noticing bullets and sounds and everything else that we noticed that was going on. And then, and so you're, you were in the military, right? You're a former Marine. So let's use some sort of fun analogies for this. The thalamus is recon, right? So that's your recon. It's pulling in all the information. And then it's sounding the red alarm. It's sounding the red light. This is fear, 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 danger, danger, danger. The amygdala, that is your fear or your emotion center. OK? Sorry, that's really messy. But that's your fear center. The amygdala then immediately alerts your hypothalamus. All right? This is what we call your command center, right? That's the headquarters at Inside Out. So the hypothalamus now has to make a decision, okay? Meanwhile, the amygdala is hanging out with another structure that's really important, as it turns out, in terms of of some of the things that, that lead up to the development of PTSD and other trauma symptoms. So the hype that this, this is the hippocampus. My patients have called it the hippopotamus. But it's the hippocampus. And that's kind of like your courtroom scribe taking notes, right? That's your note taker. And this is a really important thing, as it turns out, Taylor, when we start learning about why people some people will develop PTSD and why others don't, yeah. um, along with some other factors, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But your hippocampus is taking notes on everything that's happening that night. So what were some things that we were noticing that night? Um, the sounds of maybe fireworks, yep. because we thought you know the bullets coming at us and the sounds from that was fireworks. Um, the turf, screams, sirens, floodlights, country music, boots, hats. Absolutely, beautiful. And anything and everything all around us is now associated with that traumatic That's event. right. And so the hippocampus is taking all these notes that are later, with the help of the hypothalamus, right, going to go up to the corporate office, right? You remember what the corporate office was? That's the prefrontal cortex, right? That's our frontal lobe. That's where all the logical reasoning and judgment, judgment and um, sort of the logical thought processing happens. So the, the hypothalamus is your command center. And what happens is the hypothalamus has a decision to make. And it, it will actually, just to be safe, take two roads, the high road and the low road. The high road is this slow road to corporate office, think government paperwork, right? Goes it's there for yeah. a long time, <laughs> right? And, and it's, you know, the, the idea is that information is put in a folder, it's sent up to the prefrontal cortex where people are gonna, that part of the brain's gonna pull out all the information and say, is this really a life-threatening situation? Do we need to run? Now, do you think that would be a good idea if that were the only way that this went? Um, no, because you would be stuck with just standing there trying to figure out what to do the whole time. Yeah, that would probably not save our life. So fortunately, the hypothalamus also sends the message to the rest of the body with the low road. And low road is the shoot first, ask questions later road. And the way that it's going to get your whole body involved is through the nerves 
and through the bloodstream, okay? And I won't go into too much detail just to save us some time, but if you want to learn more about the details, please look up our articles or read the book that's coming out um, shortly in a week, and you will have a much more in-depth description. The kind of the long, uh, the long and short of it is, is that through the nerves, we have the sympathetic nervous system, right? And it's easy to remember sympathetic as in it has sympathy for us because we're about to get eaten by the saber-toothed tiger. So the sympathetic nervous system will get the, the adrenal medullas that are two small structures that live on top of the kidneys involved, and that will release a set of catecholamines, that's a fancy word, and really what that is, have you heard of epinephrine, norepinephrine? Yeah. yeah. And the other word for that is adrenaline or noradrenaline. And then on the other side, we have through the bloodstream some adrenocorticosteroid uh, and hormones that are going to trigger the pituitary, right, which is your main endocrine gland that lives in your brain. And it's going to release ultimately because of a succession of hormone release that are, hormones that are released, it will release uh, 30 or more stress hormones, right? And you've all heard of cortisol. We're getting really messy down here, Taylor. So what I want you to understand from this not necess is not necessarily all the detailed science. Well, it could be literal. It gets messy when we get over here. It does. It gets <laughs> messy. Your whole body gets involved. I mean, what do you think about that? Uh, I think once you hit that point, you don't have a whole lot in control. Um, That's going correct. Back to rule three. That's correct. I mean, this is your fight nice job with the bucket <laughs> rules. This is your fight, flight, freeze response. And we don't have a choice. As animals, we will always respond to danger with a fight, flight, or freeze response. Now, we may not like the response that we had, but we will always respond to danger. So there is no fear in thinking that you're not going to have a response that is really aimed at saving our lives. Um, this is what we call the human fear response or just the animal fear response. It's very similar in other animal groups as well. The thing that I want you to take from this is your, your entire body has gone into the mode of saving your life. And so because of that, when you were running that night in this traumatic experience, both of us were running, yep. and we had very different experiences, but probably a lot of the same symptoms. Did you have elevated heart rate? Did you Most notice definitely. your heart was racing? Did you feel hot, sweaty? Yep. Did you have tunnel vision? Uh, yeah, initially there was just a lot of tunnel vision and it was just get your head down and tell others mm -hmm. to run and, um, you know, just try to act as fast as possible. Do you feel thirsty? I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, and so, well, so my guess is, didn't write that down. <laughs> my guess is you probably did um, some very common experiences when we're having a fight, flight, freeze response are things like uh, cotton mouth. Um, feeling our heart racing. All of these are intended to move blood, and then we also have increased breathing, and that's to, intended to move blood to the larger muscle areas because we are getting ready to fight or flee or, or roll over and play dead, right? In the animal world, if you're bigger, you fight. If you're smaller, you flee, you run really fast. Or if you're not sure, you roll over and play dead or you turn green like the leaf or brown like the rock. So we do the same thing. Okay, hey, so what other questions do you have about trauma? Um, maybe how does this all apply to how maybe other people reacted that night and how they may feel that they didn't act in a certain way that they wanted to and maybe it's making them feel guilty in some sense? It's a really good question. So we don't get to choose, right? Your brain is going to choose for you. And it's probably the reason that We've all heard stories about just how many first responders were there at the concert having fun, not on duty. And some of them may not have responded the way that they've been trained to respond. And the unfortunate outcome is that they may have suffered a great deal from feeling guilty or feeling ashamed and shooting on themselves, right? Feeling like they should have done more. But the reality is we don't get to choose. 
Trauma will just happen, we will respond, we don't have moments to think about it because our prefrontal cortex is not making those decisions in that moment. Our limbic system is moving into action. Carry on, Doc. Okay, <laughs> so um, some other things that are important to remember is that during the shooting. Oh, I'm sorry, just, you just moved out of the shot. Sorry, okay. Okay. Hold on, yeah. Can we cut back to like 30 seconds from where we messed okay. up to? Yeah. 30 seconds. Okay. Yeah. Stand by for one second. Uh, what do you want me to tell you? Okay. Focus. Ready? So the bottom line is that we aren't going to choose. Our brain is going to choose for us. They're, our brain is going to choose a fight, flight, or freeze response. And unfortunately, what follows is the thought processing, and that's the part we have to work on yeah. because it's not always rational when we start thinking that, well, I'm a first responder. I should have fought. I should have jumped into action. Your brain made your decision. Yeah, and I've had a lot of should haves and must haves since then, and even, you know, you've heard my story of me yeah. reacting and Jen and I able to save some people with help of a lot of other friends and people doing the same yeah. things, but maybe moving forward, um, you know, I, I avoided for a while and I still do avoid in certain aspects. Um, how does that all apply to this? Yeah, so we're going to talk about avoidance a little bit in the next video um, uh, on avoidance because it's a really important topic. But let's talk a little bit about more uh, uh, trauma because trauma is an interesting thing. And I know that after the concert, a lot of people were wondering, and I also wondered why I couldn't remember everything, yeah. right? Most of us can't remember every single minute of what happened. We have what we call snapshot memories. And there's a reason for that. So if you think back to 9-11, if you were old enough and you remember when 9-11 happened, most of you remember exactly where you were, exactly what you were doing when you saw those planes take down the, the buildings in New York. And I can even to this day remember exactly what I was doing. I was working at NIH, turning the corner. I was in DC. We were evacuated immediately. It was very frightening. Um, the reason for that and the reason for these snapshot memories that most of us have from this experience of the Las Vegas massacre, and they're not always in order either. Usually yeah. they're not chronologically ordered and they seem very chaotic. Yeah. Um, is that, do you remember the hippocampus up here that's taking notes? Yeah, describe. So not to uh, nerd out too much, but there's a really interesting thing that has been researched for um, probably the past decade or so, a couple of decades. And now we believe there is a protein that is released that helps drive those hot spots, those snapshot memories that are probably the, the scariest moments of the night into long-term memory storage. Why does that seem like it would be a good idea? Uh, in case you come across some similar situation in the future, you can then uh, just be pre-programmed to respond maybe in a better decision-making fashion to that instance. Absolutely, that's exactly the point, is if we come across that saber-toothed tiger again, we better have really good notes about everything we noticed in that, in that. And as it turns out, that also can create some difficulties and actually turns out to be part of the problem when we develop PTSD down the line um, for those folks that do. So these snapshot memories often do represent the scariest moments. I know that in my own case, they do. Um, do you have moment-to-moment -moment memories, Taylor, or do you also have snapshot memories from that night? I would say a lot of my memory um, was really blurred at the very beginning yeah. and with significant snapshots, you know, someone getting shot near me or just screaming and all those little things are snapshotted in, but then once I kind of got past that and started to move into action to try to find a vehicle to start helping people, uh, I remember a lot more from then onward. Yeah, so those moments that you were hyper-focused, you remember very well, probably because that protein was driving those memories into long-term storage. We don't store emotionally neutral memories, but we know that we store really highly arousal, you know, just fear type of aroused uh, memories. So a lot of people have asked me, 
since this started. I, I can't remember. Is that a problem, Dr. G? Is that, you know, there, I just can't remember what happened. And my answer to you is this. Don't worry about it. It really doesn't matter if you have a full memory of what happened or not because everything that will help you become healthier and recover from trauma has to do with the way that you integrate your traumatic experience and your understanding of it into your worldview and the way you think moving forward. So actually, it's not about the activating event. The activating event, this sort of big event that happened to us, as it turns out, as we move further and further away from this traumatic event, how we feel really has nothing to do with whether we went through this or not. It has to do with the way that we've learned to interpret the world and other people and ourselves and think about all of those things in context moving forward, right? Okay, anything else that you'd like to know about trauma? Um, what helps us keep working and um, our able our ability to not discriminate and just try yeah. to keep moving forward? Great question. So we're going to talk a lot more about that when we talk about Pavlov and his dogs and classical conditioning. Um, and that'll be in our next video, which is how PTSD develops. But the bottom line is there are two things that will get you stuck. And this is for trauma, but also for other anxiety disorders. And one is avoidance behaviors. And avoidance behaviors, we'll talk about that more in our, in our other video, but that can really take a lot of sneaky forms. It's not always as obvious as avoiding thinking about things, talking about things, feeling your feelings. Sometimes we just stay super busy. Um, more, more to come on that. Um, the other thing is that our thought processing changes and we start to think about things in a much more cynical and sinister way. And then those thought processes that are highly negative and unhelpful, really, we call them maladaptive or we can call them stinking thinking. They can tend to take on a life of their own, they become a habit, and then that becomes our truth. And we're really latched on to our truth, aren't we? Mm -hmm. You've probably met lots of people in, yeah. in your interactions that just have a certain belief system about something and that's just their truth. Yeah. And everybody around them is kind of like, yeah, no, that doesn't really make sense, but they're latched onto their truth. Yeah. yeah, and that can really be a problem. That can really interfere with recovery. So the big thing to remember, and we'll just finish on this, is that trauma is treatable. It is not a forever diagnosis. Um, Actually, the majority of people who develop PTSD uh, are probably people who may have had trauma prior to this traumatic event or had pre-existing depression or anxiety. Perhaps it runs in the family. Um, or maybe there are other additional environmental stressors uh, or they learned certain types of coping behaviors in childhood into adulthood that don't serve them well. Um, but by and large, we believe that even as much as 70% of the population or more do not develop PTSD after traumatic life experiences. Now, having said that, we know that mass violence produces the highest percentage of people who develop PTSD over any other kinds of trauma. And that means natural disasters, that means rape, that means combat. Um, that was very shocking to me when I learned that, but it has something to do, we believe, with just the sinister nature that of the type of crime that somebody would come into an open setting and just randomly kill, well, the definition of mass violence is more than four people. But as we've been seeing more and more, sometimes in the double dig digits. And so um, the really important take home is that trauma is treatable. It doesn't mean that we can necess necessarily make the underlying biological or genetic predispositions. The word I use with my patients is maybe you have a sensitive brain, right? Maybe at least half the population has a sensitive brain and that means we have to work a little harder. So we may not be able to make those go away, but certainly just learning how to think more logically and in more helpful ways and learning how to not over-personalize, not let people in our bucket, and also just move into action, right? That rule number five of the bucket rules, fuck feelings, do it anyway if it's healthy. Um, that can help us really move forward from trauma. So how do you feel about all this stuff you've learned about trauma? I feel like I have a good understanding of it and that you know, it's going to take a lot of work and it's going to be individual basis, but I think, you know, with time, it, it may help and just at least understanding it 
That way I don't have to sit in it and, you know, feel like I'm alone or, you know, don't understand it. This makes it much more helpful moving forward. Good, absolutely. And you're definitely not alone. Uh, from that night, you were in the company of 22,000 people, myself included, yep. who experienced something extremely traumatic. Um, I hope that this helps all of you that we have spent uh, this video talking about trauma, just uh, some basics, Trauma 411. And if you'd like to read more about all of this, this information in detail, um, you can get it in the book that's coming out, or you can get it on Route91Therapy.com that Taylor set up for us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Taylor, for Thank being you. here.